I was not nearly as Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the American Society of International Law. My name is Wes Rist. I'm the Director of Education and Research here at ASIL. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a 107-year-old nonprofit organization focused on education and information related to international legal issues. And that everything from international environmental law, international business transactions, space law, and uh, today's topic appropriately, arms control and, and arms trade. Um, we focus on providing a nonpartisan, non-advocacy perspective. So we're very careful to maintain a sense of neutrality where people can come and actually have a conversation and engage in uh, an actual debate where um, both sides are actually heard, which seems to be becoming a rare, more and more rare opportunity here in D.C. So we're happy to be able to serve that function, especially with a topic that can be as, as difficult and as touchy as arms control and trade. Um, I'd like to mention very quickly before I introduce our moderator, who will then introduce our speakers, um, I'd like to highlight another event that we've got today at 4 o'clock at the Georgetown University Law Center, Serge Bramert, who is the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia's chief prosecutor, will actually be speaking on the, the past 20 years of international criminal law and criminal justice, So, which will be a wonderful event. It's free and open to the public. You're welcome to join us there. Again, that's 4 o'clock. There, there are flyers about the event downstairs on the um, countertop that you can take before you leave. So to moderate today's event, we have Professor Koplo from the Georgetown University Law Center here in DC. Uh, he teaches and writes on the international, uh, international public law, national security, and arms control. Um, in addition to having an academic career focused on this, he also has served in government on areas related to this. Specifically, he was Special Counsel for Arms Control to the General Counsel of the Department of Defense, Deputy General Counsel for the International Affairs at DOD, and Attorney Advisor and Special Assistant to the Director of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Your business cards must have been very long. <laughs> Um, Continued on the next card. Yeah, so we'll turn things over to him to introduce our panel and then to have a wonderful event. Our plan is to have about 45 minutes to an hour of, of discussion and to open up for question and answers at the end. Um, so we look forward to having your comments and questions as we conclude the speaking arrangement as well. Professor Coppola. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wes. And, and uh, let me extend on behalf of the panel our appreciation to the American Society for International Law for assembling what promises to be a truly interesting and timely discussion about a very important and complicated, and I think it must be said, uh, understudied or underpublicized development in international law and arms control and national security. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to serve as the moderator for this panel. I'll introduce the three speakers. They'll each talk for about 15 minutes. I'll then toss them some softball questions, uh, and then we'll throw the floor open for discussion and, uh, and comment by, uh, by all of you. This event is being uh, web streamed live to ASIL members and others around the country. Uh, and so when the time comes for you to speak up, please try to grab a microphone, and please make sure that your cell phones or other noisemakers are turned off. Our three speakers include, first, uh, Thomas M. Countryman, who is the, has been the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation for the past two years. He is a career member of the uh, Senior Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Counselor uh, and has served in the Foreign Service for over 30 years. His bureau is now responsible for leading the U.S. efforts to restrict the spread of nuclear, chemical, biological, and other weapons and associated materials. Uh, pr prior to this job, he served uh, in the Foreign Service in Yugoslavia, Egypt, Italy, Greece, uh, and the U.S. Uh, US Mission to the United Nations, among others. And he's been the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Political and Military Affairs and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for European Affairs. After him, Andrea Harrison will be the next speaker. She is the Deputy Legal Advisor in the Washington Department of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and she's responsible for legal support to ICRC activities in the United States and Canada, especially regarding detention, military commissions, privileges and immunities, and accountability mechanisms. She previously served in the ICRC Geneva headquarters as legal advisor for operations in the Near East and Middle East and Central and South, uh, Southern Africa. She has her JD from Roger Williams and LLM from the Geneva Academy of Humanitarian Law and a bachelor's degree from SMU. Our final speaker, Scott Stedgman, is the Senior Policy Advisor for Humanitarian Crisis at Oxfam America, where he provides advice to Congress, federal agencies, uh, foreign governments, the United Nations, and others on arms trade and civilian protection in armed conflict, and represents Oxfam in his travels through Africa, Europe, Latin America, and elsewhere. His previous experience on this and other issues with the Friends Committee for National Legislation, 
He has his bachelor's degree from Messiah College, a master's from the London School of Economics, uh, and has just finished his second year of law school at Penn State, uh, where he is the uh, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Law and International Affairs. Ordinarily, I would do a brief introduction as well of the treaty, um, but that will be the task of our panelists. Uh, you should know this, this document has been under negotiation for several years. It is an effort to deal with um, a huge and largely unregulated international trade estimated by some as $70 billion a year in the international arms trade, with the United States being by far the largest uh, player in that market. Uh, the treaty was open for signature on June 3rd. By the last count that I saw, 72 countries had signed. The treaty will enter into force when 50 states ratify. The treaty has also been endorsed by the United Nations General Assembly. There seems to be some controversy as to exactly what the vote was in the UNGA, but it's something like 155 to 3 with 22 abstentions. The United States has not yet signed for reasons that we'll soon discuss. The treaty deals with eight categories of, of weapons, including those on the UN registry and others, and is a treaty of unlimited duration. With that background, I'll turn things over to uh, Assistant Secretary Country. Yeah, Assistant Secretary Country. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> also want to thank the American Society of International Law for organizing this and for inviting us to participate. Um, if we could start by stepping back and considering the challenge that the ATT was intended to address. The risk of international arms transfers, conventional arms transfers, to people who would use them to carry out the world's worst crimes, including terrorism, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and other forms of violence against civilians. The transfers of such weapons to various areas around the world have fueled conflict, they have destabilized societies, and they've caused a great amount of suffering. And in seeking a way to reduce and eliminate such irresponsible transfers, uh, the motivation for the arms trade treaty was born. It's important to be clear that the arms trade treaty uh, does not in any way undermine the legitimate, irresponsible, international, legitimate, responsible international trade in conventional weapons. States have to be able to continue to provide one another in accordance with international law and agreements with the materials that are necessary to fulfill the most basic functions of a government, protecting their own citizens, securing their borders, defending their national sovereignty. Now, as the title of the treaty makes clear, the Arms Trade Treaty is not about the prohibition of the international trade and conventional arms. It is rather about the regulation of such trade. Irresponsible transfers of conventional arms, when they are enabled by poor or non-existent government oversight by the exporter or the importer, or done in black markets or gray markets that give no attention to issues of stability and human rights. These have a devastating impact on people and upon regional stability. When the Obama administration decided in 2009 to support negotiation of the arms trade treaty, this was its focus, to raise the standard for states that do not have adequate controls on international transfer of conventional arms. It is our expectation that when implemented fully, the Arms Trade Treaty will provide countries with a framework for establishing exactly such control standards, and that this will provide increased significant barriers to the illicit use of conventional arms around the world. One legal issue that I think should be disposed of rapidly, and that is the contention by some that the Arms Trade Treaty raises issues about the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution or raises the prospect of domestic gun regulations. This is not an issue for the United Nations or for international negotiation. Steps on regulation of gun ownership in the United States are a matter for the Congress and for states, not for the United Nations. And that principle was clear throughout our negotiations. We would not accept a treaty that was inconsistent 
with the Second Amendment of the Constitution, we succeeded in upholding that standard. The ATT addresses only international transfers of conventional arms. It does not apply to wholly domestic transfers or their uses, and it does not change in any way the constitutional and legal systems of the United States or of other countries. It leaves those choices on domestic issues to those countries. To talk just a minute about the legitimate, responsible international trade in arms, uh, as David noted, this is an international activity in which the United States is the largest player, <clears throat> and it should be so, given our foreign policy and national security interests, our need to enable allies and friends around the world to provide for their own domestic and international security. We participate in this activity largely through the exports of big ticket, high tech, high cost items such as fighter aircraft. Uh, now, a single fighter aircraft, let's say an FA-18, can cost $50 million or more. And that's more than the total value of all arms exports by about 170 countries put together. That plane, however, if sold to an ally of the United States, is far less likely to be involved in a human rights violation than a single inexpensive Kalashnikov assault rifle. These are the rifles that are easily available in many countries that have weak export and import controls on conventional arms. These are the kind of weapons that fuel conflict in Africa and other regions. These are what are largely killing civilians in civil conflicts around the world. Whether it is a machine gun or an airplane, the United States already has in place and has for many years an extensive and rigorous system of laws and regulations that cover all categories of conventional arms exports. Indeed, the U.S. export control system today far exceeds the requirements, the standards set by the Arms Trade Treaty. That's how it should be. We are not just the biggest dealer of conventional arms in the world. We seek to be the most responsible dealer of conventional arms in the world. But we also recognize that one size does not fit all. We could not insist that every country be raised to the standard of the United States in terms of the thoroughness of our export decision process. As desirable as that may be, it was not attainable, and it is probably not necessary for the vast majority of countries that have much smaller markets and do not need such an elaborate export control system. But the fact is that the vast majority of countries do not have even minimal controls on their exports of weapons. There are a number of countries where weapons can easily, mysteriously walk right out of national arsenals and storage facilities and cross international boundaries without control upon who is receiving the weapon and what it may be used for. And this is an area where the ATT can have real benefits in the real world. The standards that it requires can and should be used to hold nations accountable for their government's decisions on arms transfers. The treaty will compel states prior to making an export to conduct a rigorous national assessment. So in the future, rather than unauthorized, undocumented transfers across national borders, we should see across the world a control system not an international control system, but a control system administered nationally by each sovereign government that adequately reviews the request and makes a responsible decision on the export of arms to another country. This is the common minimum international standard for regulating the legitimate trade in conventional arms that the ATT seeks to establish. 
a lot of the momentum for the ATT came from African countries that have been suffering from the kind of civil conflict that we described uh, and who sought a solution in gaining greater restraint from exporting countries in their decisions to sell weapons around the world. But I think the ATT recognizes and that this is not just an issue for countries that produce and export conventional weapons. Any country that has conventional arms in its boundaries or crossing its borders needs to have export and import control <coughs> systems in place. These systems go together and they form the legal, regulatory, and enf enforcement structure that can better control international transfers of conventional arms. A country that is able to regulate, to control what goes in and out of its territory is in a better position to benefit from the arms trade treaty. So we want to focus in the future in meeting the desires that many of our friends in Africa laid out, not just on good export control systems by big producers, but also on what African and other states can do for themselves to help prevent the level of violence that many have experienced. And this includes such things as having appropriate import control mechanisms. Second, having appropriate border authority and resources that states are able to control what comes into their country. It means also better stockpile management. And this is, by the way, a program in which the United States, both through the Department of State and the Department of Defense, invests several million dollars a year helping other countries to manage their stockpiles of weapons and ammunition so that they don't simply disappear from police or military storage houses. It means for the countries that are experiencing the internal threat of violence, that they need a concerted drive against corruption, against those within the police or military ranks who will be tempted to sell weapons. And finally, it means, and again, not to pick on African states, but if we're doing a complete diagnosis of what's needed to reduce civil violence in Africa, it has to be included that the same states who advocated for this treaty all of them also need to ensure that they are not supplying weapons to sympathetic ethnic or political groups in neighboring countries. I think there's another important point of how this needs to be implemented in the future that will help to address the problem. The treaty has mandatory language requiring export and import controls uh, for countries. Uh, it also has not mandatory language, but very useful language about how states can cooperate together against the black market and gray market arms uh, that are a major aspect of the international environment. It gives countries incentives and possibilities to exchange information and to exchange legal mechanisms in order to fight against those black market and gray market trans, uh, traffickers who are well known to the international community. And we would hope to see that the ATT is vigorously employed in an effort to shut down those traffickers. Uh, what comes next now? As you said, there's 71 or 72 countries that have now signed. Uh, we look forward to 50 states ratifying and then in a certain period after that point the treaty will come into effect. To be clear, the U.S. fully supports the treaty. We think that the outcome we achieved in March is an effective implementable balance of a wide variety of interests that were expressed by more than 180 states participating in the conference. That the treaty in establishing adequate minimal standards for the international community uh, will advance not only security in the world, but also the United States foreign policy and national security interests. And it will do this 
without requiring us to change our laws, as our standards are already higher than those of the treaty, it will accomplish this without damaging the competitiveness of U.S. industry in the legitimate defense trade. And it will accomplish this without impinging in any way upon the domestic constitutional rights of U.S. citizens. So we look forward to signing the treaty in the near future. Right now, the United Nations is completing the process of ensuring that the treaty text is identical in all six official languages of the United Nations. We expect that process to be completed soon, and at that point, I think we'll be ready to sign the treaty. Um, I think that there <clears throat> is already a debate that is more appropriately left to the Senate about the value of the treaty and whether the United States should ratify this treaty. And a lot of folks are trying to stake out positions on this already. Uh, ratification is a process that will take place sometime in the future. I certainly don't expect it even this year or even next year. But at some point, the United States Senate and the American public have to debate seriously the actual advantages of this treaty. It is not a panacea. It will not end civil violence. It will not immediately force black marketers <clears throat> into retirement. But it will contribute in an incremental way, in a way that will grow as more states take more seriously their responsibilities under the treaty. And in that way, it will serve not only United States commercial interests, but also our national security and our foreign policy interests, without any of the extreme effects that opponents claim to see in the treaty. Uh, in order to get to that point where ratification is possible, it is important that we have forums like this that can discuss this in a dispassionate and objective way and that can assess the real benefits to the United States of signing up for the treaty. So I'd like to thank ASIL for providing that opportunity. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Tom. Our next speaker is Andrea Harrison. All right. Thank you, Assistant Secretary, for your comments. They're very very good explanation. Um, and thanks, ASIL, again, for having this event today. Um, as David mentioned, I work at the ICRC here in, in Washington, and one of the things I cover is, is weapons. Um, but unlike these two gentlemen who are experts on the ATT, I'm a little bit more of a generalist, but more of an expert on international humanitarian law, so I'm really going to be coming at it from that uh, sense today and discussing a couple of the provisions within the treaty um, that do discuss war crimes and, and other violations of international law. Um, but first, just I've only been working on this for about a year, but I see several members of the ATT delegation here, and it's been a privilege working with them this last year. They're all very, they're very intelligent, very scary to go against if you're ever uh, having to try to convince them of everything. They're, they really did a fabulous job representing the U.S. in, the, in New York. Um, so just thank you to them. Um, maybe a little bit of background on what the ICRC does on weapons. I know normally... When you think of the International Committee of the Red Cross, we're talking about detention, armed conflict, and we're having confidential bilateral dialogue with states, um, and that's sort of how we're known. When it comes to weapons work, it's a little bit different how we approach things. It's a much more multilateral forum, and so we're maybe a little more vocal, and, and certainly we, we approach it more as being expert counsel on issues of humanitarian law and also from our experiences in the field on humanitarian consequences of weapons or whatever it may be in the, in the particular situation. So we had some, some experts on the ATT who participated in the negotiations this year um, trying to, to make sure that, that where we had provisions on war crimes and things of this nature that it was compatible with, with the international treaties and customary international law. Um, so just to go back a little on history here, uh, the ICRC started working on the issue of arms availability in the 1990s. Um, and during this time, we were getting a lot of reports from the field, from our war surgeons, on the impact that widespread arms availability was having on local communities. Um, and, and during these discussions with states and with other national societies and things, that there was a realization this was becoming a serious problem. 
And so in 1995, there was the International Conference of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, uh, in which the state's party to the Geneva Conventions, as well as national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies, gather. And they passed a resolution requesting the ICRC to do a report looking at these issues and seeing how the widespread uh, availability of arms was perhaps causing IHL and international humanitarian law violations um, or other deteriorations of the situations of civilians on the ground in these, in these situations of violence. So, in 1999, the ICRC came out with this little pamphlet called Arms Availability and the Situation of Civilians in Armed Conflict, a very quaint font here. <laughs> um, and hopefully it'll be updated now that the Arms Trade Treaty has been, has been adopted, but uh, it's, you're welcome to come look at my, my copy right now. If you, want, if you want a copy, I can get you one, but it's, it's a little outdated at this point. Um, but the, the paper that they presented basically confirmed that, yes, the widespread of it widespread availability of arms was indeed having an effect on the ground as far as IHL violations and other violations of international law were concerned, and also that it was uh, having a really heavy impact on how humanitarian organizations like the ICRC were able to access victims um, because of security concerns. And so this report was uh, presented to the next international conference, and then over, you know, we see now 10 more years down the line, um, the ICRC has been participating in the negotiations uh, regarding the ETT since that time. Um, and they were present last year at the July conference as well as the, the negotiations in March. So just getting into some of the provisions now that, that the ICRC took a particular interest in um, from our perspective uh, were Article 6 on prohibitions and Article 7 on assessment. So for Article 6, uh, 3 in particular, uh, the wording that came out last July I'm just going to read it for you so I don't mess up, was that a state party shall not authorize a transfer of conventional arms within the scope of this treaty for the purpose of facilitating the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes constituting grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, or serious violations of common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. So this was uh, the, the main paragraph we were interested in where it's talking about how to prohibit a transfer when it would, when, when a state would, in that case, the language there, would be, tra would be transferring for the purpose of facilitating one of these violations. Uh, the concern the ICRC had with this original language last July was that in our interpretation, the Geneva Conventions uh, only apply to situations where a person is already in the power of an enemy. So a detainee, a POW, a civilian internee, and this is going to be the typical person of interest in the G Geneva Conventions. Whereas when you're talking about transfers of arms, one of your big concerns is usually going to be more about attacks on civilians, uh, indiscriminate attacks, things like of this nature, which the ICRC would consider uh, are encompassed in Additional Protocol 1 um, or Hague Law in general. Um, and so we saw that there was a bit of a gap there um, in, in what the provision was providing. Um, fortunately, the new language of the treaty uh, was a big difference. It was a significantly stronger what we saw in March and what eventually was adopted, and the ICRC was very pleased. The language now reads, still kind of the first two sentences, but the state can't transfer or is prohibited from the transfer if it has knowledge at the time of authorization that the arms or items would be used in the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity, grave breaches of Geneva Conventions of 1949, so basically the same there, attacks directed against civilian objects or civilians protected as such, or other war crimes as defined by international agreements to which it is party. So you can see the, the evolution there. Um, the March document uh, did include all these con conduct of hostilities, attacks on civilians, these types of provisions, and it wasn't restricted to any particular type of conflict. So when you look at the Geneva Conventions are only ap applicable in international armed conflict, Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions is only applicable in, well, is mainly applicable in non-international armed conflict. Um, so the language that was adopted in March uh, is really broad and could be interpreted as, as either type of conflict. So it really tried to capture as much as it could, and we were very pleased. And also because of the reference to other international agreements to which a state is party, that would include for those states who are party additional Protocol 1, the Rome Statute, other, other laws that clearly define different types of war crimes um, or violations uh, of international humanitarian law. So we thought this was a very important um, step, and we were really pleased. Um, article 7.3, which is the, the article following this, uh, became sort of a catch-all provision, that's what I call it. So where there's not a direct prohibition, um, 
states are still required to just, they don't have the knowledge that a war crime or what one of these things is going to be committed they still have to make an assessment when they have an export on um, certain things that there might be a potential or as the treaty says an overriding risk that these things would occur and some of the things it talks about having overriding risk would be if the weapons were going to be used to commit or facilitate a serious violation of international humanitarian law um, or of international human rights law. So the, the assessment provision is actually quite broad and really makes no distinction between international and non-international conflict um, and it doesn't lay out specific uh, violations as such. It's really trying to just look at the broad scope of what what this treaty is trying to prevent and how it's trying to impact uh, the civilian population of those affected um, by armed conflict. Um, so both these provisions together, when read together, I think provide quite a strong basis. Um, and the ICRC was, was very happy to see that, uh, that that progressed um, from July to March, the big, the big difference that we saw there. Um, maybe just a word, too, about generally the treaty that we were very pleased to see in the preamble uh, mention about ensuring a respect and ensure respect of international humanitarian law. It's very rare for a treaty other than the Geneva Conventions themselves or Additional Protocol 1. You don't see this language in other treaties very often and there are maybe very few examples. Um, what's actually, as far as we were able to tell a novelty in international law is that there's a reference <coughs> to respecting and ensuring respect of human rights law. Um, and that's, I mean, that was uh, new to us and was very welcomed by the ICRC to see that kind of, that again, it's a, the respect is for your own state, but then ensuring respect where you're really trying to help other states meet their own obligations under international law. Um, and I think that's really what this treaty is trying to do. It's really like uh, Assistant Secretary Country mentioned, trying to find ways to help states who don't have the same regulatory schemes and don't have the mechanisms in place um, help them find a way to meet their obligations under international humanitarian law, human rights law. Um, and so for that, I think it's, uh, uh, the ICRC was very much supportive of this treaty and it's really promoting its implementation now. I'm going to keep it short because I'd rather do questions, so. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Scott. Thank you. Um, and I thank ASO for holding this meeting. Um, and Dave is right that this issue does not get as much attention as it deserves. Um, and the lack of attention is particularly um, disheartening to me given the momentous achievement that the arms trade treaty is. Um, efforts to get a treaty on the global arms trade started close to 100 years ago. Um, the League of Nations after World War I in the 1920s um, produced two conventions um, on the trade of conventional arms, um, but neither one were were actually universalized or completed. Um, the reasons were some, some of the reasons are the same as what we hear today from the treaty skeptics, where the exporters did not want to join um, until all the other major exporters would join as well. Um, and the, some of the importers did not want to join because they were afraid that the licensing requirements and the, some of the export controls would limit their ability to receive weapons. Um, so it, it failed in, in, in in the 1920s, and then we had to wait um, until the end of the Cold War, basically, to try again. Um, there was efforts throughout the Cold War, but it never really gained any resonance um, because arms transfers in the Cold War were an essential tool of foreign policy. Both the United States and the Soviet Union would supply weapons to their proxy states or just to any country on their side of the Iron Curtain um, in order to further their objectives. Um, so it really wasn't right for any, any conversation about that at the time because everyone was in this geopolitical straitjacket and could not really talk about these issues. Um, but after the Cold War ended, th we saw an opportunity. Um, and this, can this, this campaign that led to this treaty really started about 20 years ago with a group of Nobel Peace Laureates um, led by Oscar Arias in Costa Rica where he developed a code of conduct with the other Nobel laureates on the international transfer of arms and try to promote it throughout the world. Um, it did not get as much support as, as, as he would have hoped. Um, so about 10 years ago, um, Oxfam joined together with Amnesty International and some other organization to have a global campaign um, calling for an arms trade treaty. Um, this 
movement toward a campaign coincided with the ICRC's research becoming more prominent, other countries also starting to talk about it a little bit more. But at the time, um, it was 2003, I guess, um, there wasn't much interest in Washington at all. Actually, I was laughed at quite a bit when I would raise this issue. Um, and globally, only three countries publicly professed that they wanted an arms treaty in 2003, Costa Rica, Cambodia, and Mali. Um, hardly global powerhouses. Um, but th they were countries who have, effect, who, have, who have experienced the impact of armed violence and caused by the, the availability of, of weapons, um, and they thought something needed to be done. But through our campaign, this started to change. We, we, we had, and this is one of the biggest campaigns Oxfam ever had. Um, it is the biggest campaign Oxfam ever had, um, and Amnesty as well, where we had campaigns in northern and southern countries um, really active between 2003 and 2007, calling for a treaty. And soon we started seeing more and more countries join. Um, and it really took off in 2006 when the British government decided to make this a, a part of the party, party platform of the Labour government um, during Tony Blair's second election. Um, the British government brought it within the United Nations um, and, and conversations ensued within the United Nations. The United States opposed those efforts. Um, I remember in, I think it was 2006 when they first brought it to the General Assembly, it was the United States and Zimbabwe were the only no votes to moving this forward in, in the United Nations. But we had a change administration. So in 2009, we saw Secretary Clinton make a statement in support of the Arms State Treaty. Um, as long as it was done on basis of consensus, but in general support. And at that point, it was no longer a question of whether there was going to be an arms trade treaty. It was like when, the question was when is there going to be a treaty and what kind of treaty? How strong is this treaty going to be? Now, four years later, five, five years later, four and a half years later, we have a treaty. And we have a relatively strong treaty, and, and, and it's because of the, the work of both campaigners throughout the world pushing their governments and governments, um, public servants like Tom and others we have here who really were dedicated to this cause and worked tremendously, tremendously hard to make this happen. Um, and now we have a really, now we have a, a pretty strong treaty. Um, but now I want to get to actually what I want to talk about is what change will this treaty actually bring? Um, Andrew mentioned the IHL components and the, some of the human rights components, um, and Tom talked about what other countries need to do in terms of building up their, their systems. I want to talk about what the United States needs to do. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going to do this through, I know we don't have any opponents here um, on the panel, by <laughs> opponents of the treaty, is to put out the three critiques I hear most and address those and say what the, what the treaty will do through addressing these critiques. Um, the th three critiques are first from the gun lobby, which argues um, sometimes that it's a global gun grab that the UN is going to take away everybody's guns. And other times, this treaty would require the United States to adopt measures that would infringe upon Americans' right to keep and bear arms. Um, I also address the critique from the left, which is that this treaty is, is worthless because there's no global enforcement mechanism. There's no... Um, you know, decision tribunal that says when an arms transfer could occur or could not. Um, and then the U.S. won't need to change its laws anyway, so the U.S. is going to go about doing the same thing it always has done. And then I'll, I'll talk about the right, where they'll say that it's an infringement upon U.S. sovereignty, um, that the, the, the treaty will uh, require the United States to give up some of its power to the United Nations to decide who to transfer weapons to um, and to protect itself and its allies. Um, well, all these arguments are, are incorrect. Some of them have more um, foundation than others. Um, the gun lobby first, I'm not going to address this because, um, too much time on this because Tom did. Um, and I think this, this critique is so off base that I don't even believe that its proponents actually believe it. Uh, I think they actually know that the treaty is not going to do anything that it says <laughs> because they can read. And the words of the treaty are very clear that it is the sovereign right of any state to regulate and control conventional arms exclusively within its territory, pursuant to its own legal and constitutional systems. That's very, very clear. Then, so the, the, they'll read that and they'll say, well, that's only the preamble. It's not, in the re it's not in the body of the treaty, so it's not really as strong. Although I don't know many treaties that have scope into what it does include and then what it doesn't. I think it's pretty clear in the scope. It says 
this is what it includes. Um, so they say it's not good enough, but the treaty itself says that it is only about the international trade of conventional arms, which is when a transfer, basically, when weapons move across border and the, and the, the control or title of the weapon changes hands as well. So it's not an individual gun owner going to travel to Europe to go hunting that is covered by this treaty, it's just when the weapons change title and control as well. But the only thing that maybe possibly touches upon domestic regulation is this requirement in the treaty for all countries to take steps to prevent the diversion of weapons into the illicit market. But at the same time, that is not a new requirement for the United States. The United States has extensive laws preventing weapons from going into the black market. Some work better than others. Um, sometimes it's not as effective as we see with some weapons going to Mexico, but they have they, they are taking action and they try to improve that action. Um, so I don't see that as actually being a strong critique. Um, so I just think that this the gun lobby just looks at this as a a, a a good thing to mobilize their base and to raise money at a time when they're winning in Congress on other things. So they have to have the specter of the UN with black helicopters coming down and taking the weapons. So I'm, I'll leave it right there. But the, the other critiques, the second, the, from the liberal side, from the left and from the right, maybe have a little bit more foundation. Um, and first let me address the issue from the left, which is that because this treaty does not actually require the U.S. to do anything different, it's not going to have a transformative effect on the arms trade. The U.S. has is up to 70% of the global trade going to the Congressional Research Service. And if the U.S. doesn't have to change anything, how is the arms trade going to be transformed? And the Assistant Secretary Countryman is correct that it will not require the U.S. to change its laws in any way. Um, Congress has delegated broad authority to the executive on, to, on controlling on export controls um, through the Arms Export Control Act. Um, in the Arms Export Control Act, it, it just says that decisions on issuing export license of conventional arms must take into account whether the export would contribute to an arms race, aid in the development of weapons of mass destruction, support terrorism, increase the possibility or escalation of conflict, or prejudice the development of bilateral or multilateral arms control agreements. This this is pretty broad, and uh, of what of what the licensing officers must take into account. So the administration has kind of spelled that out a little bit more in Presidential Decision Directive 34 from 1995, which is still the guiding policy for U.S. conventional arms um, And I'm not going to go into the details of that because that would take some time, but basically what the U.S. policy is is that it's a balancing exercise. Um, and for the past 20 years, this is how the U.S. have decided arms transfers, where they, they try to strike a balance between the risk posed by the weapons for fueling human rights abuses against the risk of not trading the weapons and whether that would lead to more human rights abuses. A balance between the requirements of maintaining an alliance and what you would need to, to, to maintain such an alliance and the risk to global security or regional security from transferring that weapon and upsetting a country's neighbors. Um, the, the, the balancing the, the economic benefits to U.S. manufacturing base versus the, the, the negative effects to a country's economy from the arms transfer in terms of fueling corruption or um, moving funds that could have been better spent on development into the military sector. So they, they do this balancing exercise. Um, and the arms trade treaty to some extent builds that balance into international law. It is similar to what the Arms Export Control Act envisions, though not exactly the same. Um, and similar to what PDD 34 does, though I think it goes a bit further. Um, Andrea talked about Article 7 of the treaty, where it says that countries must look at the, the benefits to peace and security of the arms transfers, and then assess the risk to human rights, IHL, international terrorism, and transnational organized crime. And if the risks, over, uh, if there's an overriding risk of the negative things occurring, then the transfer shall not move forward. So basically, they look at the good, they look at the bad. If the bad outweighs the good, then you cannot transfer, which is essentially what the U.S. does right now. Um, so, but, so it won't require any change in law. I think Tom is correct. It won't require any change in law. 
But I believe that this, the, the treaty goes further than what the U.S. currently does and what it says in PDD 34. And over time, by virtue of the treaty creating a global norm that stigmatizes certain types of arms transfers, it will have an effect on U.S. practice. Um, and, and this group knows this very well, um, that you know, certain treaties are contractual treaties that require some governments to give something for, enough, for other governments to give it other things, such as the NPT, where um, nuclear weapon states agree to progressive disarmament and the non-nuclear weapon states agree to not uh, build a nuclear bomb. Um, and other treaties are lawmaking treaties, where it sets a standard by which countries must adhere. Um, and so these treaties set global norms of behavior that m all states must follow or accept the consequences. Sometimes the consequences are, I mean, sanctions or criminal law, and other times it's just international condemnation and looking like a pariah state. And the Arms Trade Treaty isn't the latter. It's more about international condemnation. There's no global mechanism. Um, so according to the treaty, certain transfers are never appropriate. When, they, when the exporter knows that they would be used for war crimes, for example. And other times they are appropriate only when the risk is so low that the benefit overrides them. But there's nothing in US law that says that when the US knows the transfer is going to um, be used for crimes against humanity, it is absolutely never appropriate. Nothing there right now. Um, and there is nothing that's, that, that, says, that actually says that if the benefit to peace is greater than the risk, then you can transfer and vice versa, you cannot. You could argue that has been U.S. policy when the U.S. is at its best, but the U.S. is not always at its best. Um, sometimes the U.S. transfers weapons when they know there's an overriding risk of these negative acts because of political pressure. I would say the situation in Syria right now is one of those situations. Um, or when they see that there's a strong need to combat terrorism, the situation in Bahrain. Or when the alliance seems to require it, such as U.S. support for Mubarak's Egypt with armored vehicles or riot control gears, which were used, riot equipment that was used against the population in Tahrir Square. So I think the treaty will have an impact because it will set a standard that would stigmatize certain types of transfers and make it more difficult for the United States to transfer those. They can still do it legally. Um, however, if they're, if they're going to disregard the global standard, they're going to have to face some condemnation. And then finally, quickly, I'm going to address the issue of the right that this treaty gives up sovereignty. Um, the argument put out by some less informed um, commentators and some members of Congress even, that the treaty gives the United Nations the power to tell the United States when an export is appropriate is ridiculous, and, and the Assistant Secretary mentioned how ridiculous it is. Um, all decisions under this treaty are made by national governments. Um, and there is no international body that can veto an arms transfer. Arms trade is a legitimate activity that states will, need to, will do to, to protect themselves and have their allies protect their, their populations. Um, but all treaties do give up sovereignty. There is, there's some truth to this argument. Um, that's the whole point of a treaty. You're giving up some sovereignty for some benefit. Um, the sovereignty the U.S. will give up by joining this treaty is its right to lower its domestic export controls to a standard below what the treaty prescribes. Of course, they don't really need to, they don't give up their sovereignty because Congress could always lower those standards based upon the last in time rule. Um, but if they're going to do so, they're going to have to face some domestic pressure and international pressure and possibly withdraw from the treaty, which has political ramifications. Um, so the treaty basically sets a bar at where this administration currently is on international arms transfers and then if any government wants to move forward and lower those, they're going to have to face those consequences. But in exchange, they get something. They get to do, the United States gets to be involved in the programs that the Secretary mentioned. Um, some dozens of countries will be building national export control policy uh, regimes in the, next, in the next few years. And the United States now has the ability to work with those governments to build systems that advance U.S. interests and U.S. security. Um, Assistant Secretary mentioned all the reasons why the unrestrained arms trade is bad for U.S. security and, and global security, and now the U.S. has the ability to go in there um, with those countries to help them develop those, those standards from the ground up. 
um, and they do so with their export control and border security assistance. Um, so the U.S. does get a lot for giving up its, 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 its some sovereignty, although it's very minor. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just conclude there that basically that the treaty clearly is not a gun grab. It's not worthless, because I do believe that it will change U.S. behavior, um, and it doesn't give up that much sovereignty. It's an appropriate amount of sovereignty it gives up. Um, so I'll just end right there. Well, uh, thank you, Scott, and thank all three of you. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to uh, open things up to the floor. But before that, I'm going to exercise or abuse the power of the chair to ask the first couple of questions. And we're going to do that by coming at it from a more skeptical perspective. That is, our three panelists, for all their other wonderful contributions, are all three basically supportive of this initiative in, in, in favor of the, the ATT. And we do not have on the panel a dedicated skeptic. I will therefore act as devil's advocate in this. Maybe some of you in the audience will join me in this, uh, in asking some of the harder questions about this. And, and I think the place to begin is with the, uh, with the comment that uh, you began with on the, uh, the gun grab issue. That is, one thing we know is that this treaty has not attracted much public attention yet. There hasn't been a lot about this outside the specialized press. The one aspect that has attracted attention is the opposition from the NRA. We've seen skepticism expressed by more than one third of the Senate, sufficient to block ratification of the treaty. Last Friday, uh, the House adopted a reservation, uh, a, 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 an amendment to the Defense Authorization Bill opposing the, our, the, the treaty. Um, and the question is, as, as Scott suggested, maybe the NRA doesn't really believe this. Maybe they're just using this argument as a stalking horse. But I don't think that's sufficient. I think we need to get to the bottom of this and see whether there is any merit at all to this argument. Um, the, I think the, the, the best um, argument that can be put forward on behalf of the, uh, the, the gun grab issue here is not that there's a provision in the text of the treaty that restricts gun ownership. Uh, the the, the, there is no, no specific article of the treaty that would be at issue here. There are some parts of the treaty that do not seem to be completely focused on international trade. The original uh, Article I statement of the object and purpose has some more general provisions about arms traffic rather than international arms traffic. But more generally, I think the question is whether this would represent for the United States and for the international community the first step on a process that would ultimately result in some constriction, uh, some effort to constrict Second Amendment rights. So the question for all three of you, is there anything to this? Is there any basis for the NRA and their allies in Congress to oppose this treaty on those grounds? No. <laughs> in, in your view, is the NRA just hallucinating on this point? <clears throat> Look, there's, uh, there's plenty of Americans who believe passionately in the Second Amendment. Uh, and that includes the President and his administration. And that is why it was a touchstone for this administration that we would not permit anything that would call into question our commitment to the Second Amendment and in protecting the constitutional rights of American citizens. I don't object to citizens being vigilant in defense of their rights and of their interests. That is the basis of American democracy. But I've noticed over the years in this town a growing tendency to cross sometimes very rapidly from defense of one's interests into exaggeration, into outright fabrication, particularly if there is a political or financial motivation for doing so. And I think that that is a large part of what's happening today that there is a political reason to exaggerate and then to invent an argument about the effect this would have domestically. And there's also a financial motivation. It helps fundraising 
and it helps to remind Congress who's in charge. Uh, the Congress, of course, is in charge, is what I meant to say. Um, so uh, there is no factual, no logical basis for the charge, but there is always a rhetorical argument to be made in the absence of facts. Andrew, Scott, 38 senators, a majority of the House of Representatives, all off base. Yes. Um, well, I would, about these amendments, um, these amendments come up and the language is just sweeping and, um, make, and then these congressmen make these outlandish statements, but what actually gets passed is never really that bad. Um, like on last Friday, what they, you know, the language says that the Defense Department cannot implement the Arms Trade Treaty until it's been ratified by the Senate and implementing legislation has been passed by both Congress. Well, that is basically what the U.S. would do anyway. So nothing is bad um, at all. But it's a political victory for them, and, and it doesn't actually do anything. And, and I think that shows that they're out of ideas. They don't have, they know that they have nothing to actually, they, they, have no, they have no dog in that fight. So they just pass laws that do what the U.S. would do anyway. Um, and then they keep changing the argument. So we hear Ambassador Bolton say that this is a gun grab because there is a requirement that each country develop a national control list. And that's why it's a gun grab. Um, because every American then will have to, you know, put their guns on a list. Which is absolutely ridiculous. A national control list is just listing which items in international commerce is controlled by export controls and which items are not. The U.S. has had that list since 1976. Ambassador Bolton oversaw that list when he was the Undersecretary of State for, for International Security and Arms Control. And Ambassador Bolton didn't say anything bad about that list when he was in that position, only when he got a position on the board of the NRA did he decide to go to the Wall Street Journal and do it. And once you dispute that, they come up with a different one. And then they dispute that, and they come up with a different argument. And so they don't really have many ideas. They're just trying to grab onto something that maybe would gain resonance and, and help, their, you know, help them in electoral races and to mobilize their base when they're not really doing much outside of this. And yet, more than a blocking one-third of the Senate has expressed these concerns. I, okay, in, oh, in the resolution, yes, in the resolution. I, I think and this, in the letters, this, in, in yeah. letters to Secretary Clinton. Yes, I, I think that there is a political reason to oppose this treaty in the Senate right now from people from certain states, and there's very little, politi very little political cost placed on them for putting their name out on there. And there's no political benefit in, out in standing in support of the Arms Trade Treaty because there whatever Oxfam and Amnesty International and all these other groups were put, were put together would never even close have the size of just the radical fringe of the gun lobby. Um, and they put money in elections and they um, really do sway votes. And so there's a political reason and, and they, 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 they put these votes out there in order to score them and members are not going to vote against it. Well, let me, let me direct the panel's attention to Article 1, the object and purpose of the treaty. Uh, this is a somewhat unusually structured provision. It says the object, the purpose is uh, the object of the treaty is, and then there are two elements, and then the purpose of the treaty is, and then there are three elements. Uh, and some of those five elements explicitly include the word international, and some of those five elements do not. So that the first one, uh, the object, is to establish the highest possible common international standards, but the second object of the treaty is to prevent and eradicate the illicit trade in conventional arms and prevent their diversion, without the word international. In the second half of that article, the purpose, first begin, the first one is to contribute to international and regional peace and security and stability. The second one says to reducing human suffering, without the word international. Is that just seeing a ghost in the closet to think that there's something there, not a, an immediate gun grab, but leading the path, leading us down the pathway toward something that could um, run up against sincere Second Amendment concerns. <clears throat> well, I've I've lived in the Arab world, so I understand conspiracy theory mentality, uh, and this is another example of it. Uh, what is the pathway to a gun grab? 
does the pathway run through the Congress or not? There is no conceivable way, even in the heated imagination of somebody who thinks that human suffering is different from international human suffering, there is no conceivable way for such action to take place without going through the United States Congress. It doesn't happen. This treaty gives the UN no authority to do a goddamn thing within the United Nation, the United States borders. Zero. Uh, so yeah, I think it is uh, a little bit more than belief in paranormal that motivates these fellows to see ghosts where none exist. Um, I must say it's, it's a little fun to play the role of devil's advocate with this group, and so I'm, I'm going to take another step. Um, Potentially lucrative. <laughs> another kind of criticism that is frequently leveled at arms control treaties, at human rights treaties, at, um, at all sorts of, uh, of progressive international efforts is uh, the sort of thing that, that I think Scott was touching on at, at one point, that uh, this sort of regulation is unnecessary when applied to the good guys, the responsible international actors such as the United States whose current policies already far exceed those of the treaty. Uh, so it's unnecessary there. And this sort of regulation is ineffective when it comes to the bad guys because whether they join the treaty or not, they won't live up to the standards. And the treaty has very little by way of effective verification or enforcement. So as a result, you have a pious international declaration that is either unnecessary or ineffective. What's the response to that? I can start on that one. Um, from, from my perspective, and working on other international treaties as well, the fact that a state might already be in compliance is usually not, re it, it doesn't matter, okay, maybe that state might not have to do anything else, but if it's a state that's a, a bigger player like the US, it's gonna be a model to other states. So the fact that the US signed up the Arms Trade Treaty, even if it didn't have to do a single thing to, to be in better compliance in the future, I think it sends a really strong signal. To but we are, aren't we already giving that model, even without this tr this treaty? Uh, and I think from going back to your points before on the Second Amendment, no. I mean, I think those things are considered domestic U.S. law, just how the U.S. does things. Whereas the fact that they were willing to engage in this international agreement, I think that that makes it that they're giving a statement that they want to see other countries um, have the same complies mechanisms as themselves. So that would be mine. I think norms are powerful things. I don't think they're just words on pieces of paper. I think that countries do not like to be seen as, as breaking international law. They do not like to be seen as pariah states. When this treaty is, is ratified, implemented by countries like the United States and China and all of Europe, it's going to set a high standard that all other countries must either adhere to or be willing to face the condemnation. And this condemnation is not just going to come from other nation states, it's going to come from their domestic civil society as well. The, the treaty requires each country to put these standards in domestic law. Um, and so you have, not only do you have the people in those countries who will be demanding their own representatives to, own, to follow their own law, you have the legislature having a check on some governments as well. Sometimes those governments are not free and it doesn't matter, um, but those, those countries will be swayed by both the, dom the domestic outcry from civilian populations and from international condemnation. We've seen this over and over again, how many countries um, have not signed on to the Anti-Personal Landmine Treaty, but are still quite adhering to it. Only a, very, a handful of countries every year actually use anti-personal mines, and those countries are the ones that don't really care about being called out. Um, it's the Burmas of the world. Um, it's a, they don't, so countries do change their behavior to fit in with international standards. Is it perfect? Could it be better? Uh, to, could there be some enforcement mechanism? Ideally, yes, but that, the, the negotiations could not bear that at this point. Um, and this is what we have to live with. And I think it could be successful as long as there is concerted activism by people in their own countries and by other countries holding each other to account. I'm proud of all the ways in which the United States over the centuries has 
challenged itself in its laws and its government to live up to the ideals upon which it was founded. And I'm proud of all the ways that the United States has, over the centuries, led the world towards a more secure and peaceful coexistence among nations. And I can't think of any reason why the United States should not continue to advance those two high standards in tandem. And to the countries on the other end of the spectrum, Russia and China, for example, have not signed the treaty. Um, the countries that voted against its adoption in the General Assembly, is imaginable that U.S. or others joining this treaty would change their behavior, would, would get North Korea or Russia or China to not make the kinds of international arms sales that they have been making in the past? First of all, those nations, particularly Iran and Syria, are primarily arms importers. They do have important exports. Iran today daily is exporting weapons to the Assad regime in Syria. Syria continues to export weapons to Hezbollah, even as they have a state of war at home. North Korea continues to seek to earn hard currency by selling its crappy weapons because it doesn't have anything else worth selling. Uh, the, uh, uh, so they are exporters, but they are major importers as well. Not North Korea at the moment, but Iran and Syria. Uh, and the treaty does not make it easier for them to buy and sell weapons. It makes it harder. And that's exactly why they voted against it. And it seems to me that something that makes it harder for Iran and Syria to buy and sell weapons ought to be in the United States' interests. Let me ask one further question before we turn it to the audience. Uh, and that is that the world events have, unfortunately, given us a case study to test this treaty, that is Syria. And let me ask each of you how you think the world would be different if this treaty were in force for the United States and other relevant players, uh, if it were already in force, how, how would that change the world's dealings with Syria? <laughs> it was already in force. Um, the United States or the world's dealing? The United world, right? So Whichever the, form of that question is hardest so, for you to deal with. OK. Is the, the, there is a, you know, in Article 6, Three of the treaty, there is an outright prohibition on arms transfers when the exporter knows that the importer will be using them for war crimes and for directed attacks against civilian populations and objects. I think it would be very difficult for any country to um, look at the situation in Syria and, and say that they do not know that the Assad regime would be using, the, using these weapons for these types of crimes. But I think the treaty would set a outright prohibition on these transfers. Would those countries, if, the, um, you know, if they were members of the treaty, um, the thought experiment here, would that, would that have made a difference? I'm not sure. I think that Russia would have to deal with, you know, deal with the fact that what they're transferred would, would be illegal and Russia would, would have to do some legal gymnastics to get around it. Um, the fact is right now Russia's armed transfers to Assad regime are completely legal because there's no UN Security Council resolution, arms embargo on the country. They are horrific, but it's legal. Um, on the other side, um, you know, what the treaty would require is for the United States or other governments to look at the, mm -hmm. the, the, the risk that the weapons would be used for human rights abuses, IHL violations, serious human rights abuses, serious violations of IHL, um, acts of terrorism or transnational organized crime. Um, it's clear that there are risks for each of these, um, not, maybe not organized crime, but there's risks for terrorism, IHL violations, and human rights violations. Um, it's significant risk. And, but only if, and then the U.S. would have to assess what the benefits of that transfer would be. Um, and if the, the risks override the benefit, the U.S. shall not transfer according to the treaty. It seems to me that this administration has been following that, um, the, has been looking at the risk and said the risk has been too grand, too great for us to transfer right now. I, it seems to me that there was a tipping point with this um, report that there is, that there was use of chemical weapons. Um, that there has been um, the, the 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 opposition has been losing ground. That now that 
the risks are not overriding anymore to them. But how should the use of chemical weapons by the regime influence the calculation about the danger that the recipients might use the weapons, use U.S. weapons for a prohibited, for a prohibited purpose? I, I have to ask the U.S., but I, I have the government people, but I believe that it would probably, the calculation would be that the risk to international peace and security is so much by the use of chemical weapons, risk to human security is so great by the use of chemical weapons, that the need to defeat the Assad regime on the battlefield is, would require the weapons, and, and the risks are not outweighed by this benefit, but I'm not a government official. Well, we have one here. <laughs> Yeah, but government officials are trained not to answer hypothetical questions, <laughs> especially when coming from hypothetical <laughs> skeptics. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I think I would say very briefly that if we had this situation today and the treaty had already been in force for a while, the political cost to Russia and to Iran for continuing to supply weapons to the Assad regime would be higher than it is today. Whether the political cost would be sufficient to prevent them from doing it, I don't know. Similarly, for the United States side, I think Scott is right on that the question of providing weapons to the opposition is incredibly complex. There are big benefits and big risks and great difficulty in measuring either. And since the United States already takes into account all the criteria that are involved in the ATT, I can't say that if the ATT were enforced today for the United States that this issue would be any easier or any harder than it already is. And maybe just to add uh, a final thing, the Article 7.2 also includes the provision on mitigating measures, so if you are going to authorize a transfer because uh, you've done this balancing test, whatever, you're also supposed to look at how you might be able to take measures. So uh, one measure could be that if you're going to make a transfer to one of the parties there that you would maybe have to train their, provide some training on international humanitarian law or something of this nature where you would hopefully see some sort of proactive measures taken. And that's just an example. I don't know how much that was discussed uh, as a possibility, but that's how I've read the, um, Article 7. Of, of, how that would apply today to the situation of Syria. Good, thank you. Okay. Questions from the floor? Yes. <laughs> Friendly question, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, hi. Um, I'm actually going to exercise the prerogative of making a comment rather than a question. Just um, identify yeah, so I, my name is Jennifer Lansaddle. I'm also with the State Department and was on the U.S. delegation. I'm one of the attorneys that, that uh, was on the delegation and, and advising Tom. Um, and I just wanted to respond quickly to the, the questions and the, and the discussion about the House National Defense Authorization Act amendment that was passed on the Arms Trade Treaty because I was, I was very pleased, I mean, by Scott to hear you discount that it would have any effect. I think actually we're watching that amendment quite closely and I think for people in this room I think you know making sure that the Congress doesn't limit the US's ability to participate in the arms trade treaty regime as it develops and before we actually might become a party to that treaty is actually very very important and so I wouldn't actually discount the impact that cutting off all funding for DOD to be able to participate in for example let's say a meeting of the Conference of States parties um, and and actually be there and represent U.S. interests. Um, you know, representing U.S. interests in the negotiations was one of the reasons we got involved in those negotiations in the first place. Um, and also, it, the, the the drafting of that amendment was was very interesting in the sense that it actually required the president to sign the treaty when there's no requirement that that President Obama be the one, Secretary Kerry could be the one, someone else. Uh, provided with full powers could be. And also the, the administration has identified that no need for implementing legislation. So requiring implementing legislation is also a, a strange aspect to that amendment. So again, I think just with if there are possible constituents in the room who care about the arms trade treaty, I think watching watching the development of, of restrictions like that is is really important. And my colleagues here, I don't know if you want to say anything also that's following up. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Meyer. I'm also with the State Department uh, Legal and with Jennifer. I was one of the state attorneys on the, the delegation. And I just wanted to thank Andrea for her comment on the mitigation point. Um, uh, uh, we're talking about the assessments because for us that was very important. 
uh, because we it, it isn't really oh there's a risk so then you just have the balancing test I mean the mitigation aspect in there is important to uh, mitigate the risk with any arms transfer we realize that arms transfers and we do this now are not risk-free uh, but uh, the United States has a very strong system with um, license provisos and other things that we put on when we license transfers to to mitigate any type of those types of risks uh, and that would be something that we would have to do here like you said through training uh, the lay type betting different things that, that those are available to help mitigate that risk and reduce the risk when you make any sort of arms transfer that's that's all I've got now does anyone have an actual question <laughs> Thank you. I'll uh, preface my question with a... Introduce yourself. Oh, uh, Chris Bidwell, Federation of American Scientists. Uh, my, uh, my observation is I, I noticed some, some well uh, thought through legal arguments against this, the Second Amendment rebuff to this treaty, but I, I note that they're legal arguments. And for the Second Amendment folks, this is an emotional issue. And to try to rebut an emotional, uh, you know, emotional issue with legal arguments, I don't think bodes well for, for the future of this treaty getting signed into law by the Senate. That being the case, now I come to the question, that being the case, if the United States does not sign or, or does not uh, ratify the treaty, I think there's a chance it might be signed, uh, if the United States does not ratify the treaty, then uh, does it, we end up kind of like a situation with the law of the sea where we're a bit of a pariah and yet we are the largest seller of arms in, in, in the world. Does this treaty really have any effect? Is, is it really almost counterproductive? I'll, I'll offer this as a question. Might it become counterproductive if, if the U.S. can't ratify this treaty to, to the overall cause, which is, is a worthy and, and valuable cause of, of preventing atrocities? Thank you. Thanks. There's a couple good points there. One is, yeah, there are legal arguments and there are presented better than we can by the American Bar Association, which studied the issue carefully and put out a nice little three or four page publication that concludes that there is simply no threat to the Second Amendment from this treaty. Uh, but you're right that they're, uh, uh, you know, trying to fight uh, emotion with logic is difficult. There can be mo emotion mobilized on both sides. I do believe that there is a direct benefit to the United States, to civilians abroad, tourists, missionaries, diplomats, and military abroad, if the supply of weapons to every fanatic group in the world is somehow restricted. Uh, and, you know, it is possible to mobilize the photographs of innocent Americans who got caught in the wrong place in a civilian conflict in Africa or someone else, somewhere else and show how that happens. Uh, that's not a campaign for the State Department to do. We need to deal with the facts and with the greatest degree possible a uh, straight assessment of the U.S. interests. Uh, I think that uh, I'm not sure how much we feel as a pariah under the law of the sea treaty. Uh, I know that we shouldn't feel a pariah on the rights of handicapped or disabled individuals, even though we failed to ratify that treaty as well. Um, I think as long as the United States is implementing the treaty in full and on the assumption that this amendment cutting off funding for implementation of the ATT doesn't require us to violate our own long established export control procedures. Uh, as long as we're doing that, I'm not too concerned about that. And it is certainly not an argument that we would advance for ratification. Rather, the argument has to be this is in our interests. It has no effect on our economic and legal standing or on the rights of citizens, but it has these benefits. I, I, I would never say that the U.S. It doesn't matter if the U.S. doesn't ratify because I believe it is in the U.S. interest to ratify. I believe it's, it's necessary to play its role as a global leader um, on this issue and on human rights to set the standard and to ratify this treaty. Um, so I think it's important that they do ratify this treaty. I, I think the Secretary is correct. As long as the United States continues to implement this treaty or continue to do what it does now, um, 
shaped by the global norms, of course, I think that you know, it's still going to further the cause of the arms trade treaty. Um, but ultimately, I believe that Congress needs to ratify, the Senate needs to ratify this treaty. Um, and I think that they will eventually. I think that this is a, a moment where the United Nations and international law is not appreciated by the Senate, but it's just a moment. It's not necessarily going to last forever. Um, we've seen that with the Genocide Convention, where it took many, many years for it to be ratified. Um, and, but there was, you know, Senator Proxmire on the floor every day calling for it, calling for it, and then eventually we, we, the U.S. did it. I think this is the same thing with this treaty. I think that it will be ratified once members of Congress can take a step back from this political moment, read the treaty, or have it, or get someone not to explain to them what is in the treaty if they don't want to read it, um, and then they and then they can look at look at the benefits and look and and any possible costs of this treaty and make a, a sound decision. I have faith that the Senate will eventually do that. I do not think that they're going to do that. Uh, anytime really soon, and I don't see it's in their political interest to give the president a win on this thing right now. Um, and that relates to the emotional thing. I, I write um, blogs about you know dispelling the myths of the the gun lobby on this treaty using legal language, using policy language, and I get you know dozens and dozens and dozens of comments. Um, very emotional, you know, the UN, you know, U.S. out of the UN stuff, uh, president's a socialist, and things like that. I can't argue with them in, on that level. I mean, so those who are saying that the President of the United States is anti-American and wants to take away American guns are not someone we can have a conversation with on any, any level, emotional level or factual. All I can do is provide the truth and hope that members of Congress, senators, will do their duty. Next question. Yes. Hi, Andrew Bennett. I have a question about uh, the sort of advantages and disadvantages of transparency in arms trade. Uh, we talked a lot about the prohibition, but not about you know who's transferring weapons to whom and what role that has in mitigating effects on human rights and IHL violations. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, I think you're first. Okay, I don't know. Um, well, I mean, I think transparency is really important. I know the treaty itself, the language tried to avoid having a little too much of, of transparency requirements because a lot of states actually have their export control lists would be classified information, for instance. Um, and so they took into account that certain domestic systems um, would not allow for that. Um, and I think, I mean, I think, again, it's maybe overall be better to have more transparency, but if it was a matter of whether or not this treaty would get past, um, I don't know, I don't know if that's really answering your question, but I think, uh, I think of course we all would have, would prefer it, but I think between bilateral dialogues with states like the U.S. who would maybe work on helping uh, smaller states to get implementation mechanisms, you would think the transparency would be there, but maybe it would be public necessarily knowledge, and I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing that the whole world knows what's going on, but I don't know, that's my opinion, not the ICRC. I think that this treaty does more for transparency than Andrea um, states. I think that their um, the drafting was very careful, and I think that they it, it does require countries to share with the other state parties what is in their control list and an annual and a year after it enters into force to do an annual report on what transfers that they have conducted in the last year. That raises an interesting question for the United States, which I, I want to know how the United States is going to deal with it in an open question that there are certain transfers. The United States does not publicly uh, um, state that they, they, they're clandestine transfers, right? They do not take credit for those transfers. How the United States is going to deal with that with reporting is an open question. Whether it's going to be reserved in any ratification, I don't know. But other countries are watching that as well. And so some countries, if the United States does, decides to keep everything, all these this group of transfers secret, they'll do, they'll do it as well and they'll make it wider and wider and wider. While you know, clandestine sales are quite small, I hear, I don't know, um, <laughs> other countries could then use that justification to be broader and broader and not, not acknowledge their transfers. Tom, can you tell us anything secret? <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> I think you had a question in the back. 
Uh, hi, my name is Meg. I'm a student at Georgetown University Law Center, and my question is about the relationship of the ATT to other international arms treaties, namely the OAS Firearms uh, Convention, or SIFTA, and the UN Firearms Protocol against the illicit manufacturing of and trafficking in firearms, um, neither of which the U.S. is a party to. So my question is, if the U.S. signs or ratifies the ATT, does that create more or less of an impetus for the U.S. to get on board with these other firearms protocols? Hmm. I, I might ask one of my delegation to help me out on this, but the, the first point I would make is that uh, the U.S. differed from a number of other delegations in New York in that we did not consider this a firearms or an arms control treaty. This is a trade treaty. Any, anything specifically on the question asked, Jennifer? I mean, not, no one here, unfortunately, is, a, is an expert in, in the OAS convention or the um, the protocol to the to the UNTOC. But I mean, a, as a process matter, you, the U.S. joining those those conventions is is really being considered as a separate issue. Um, the ATT, in in many ways, goes goes far beyond those protocols in terms of its scope of arms that are covered. It's obviously much more than just firearms. It goes all the way up to the big stuff, the planes and the helicopters. Um, and it also establishes a lot of other uh, regulations with respect to to export, import, brokering, transit, transshipment. It's just it's just a different type of treaty. But it's a good question. But separate, they're being they're being considered separately. So, oh, could I have one? So I just wanted to respond to to Scott's last point too. There's actually, if you look at um, Article 13.3, there's an explicit carve out for reports on commercially sensitive or national security information. So that's how states would deal with classified transfers. Anything else, sir? I'm just wondering how broad that's going to end up being and how other countries are going to do it. I, I'm not worried about the United States making that. Um, I don't think Congress would allow the U.S. to keep on expanding that category and not report if Congress requires reports. Um, but the question of how other countries are going to use the U.S. example in their benefit is, is something I'm concerned about. I think we have time for one more question in the back. Uh, my name is Neil McKay with Human Events. I just wanted to um, just to clarify, because I got mixed up, and maybe it's because I was here late, that the administration has not is not going to ask for in, for legislation to implement the treaty if it's ratified, but the administration will, through administrative or executive actions, will implement the treaty. Did, is is that is that how the process works? The United States is already implementing the treaty, in that the United States law approved by the Congress requires higher standards of behavior in arms trade than the treaty requires. So there is no need for additional implementing legislation or regulation. Um, any of the panelists have any final comments on this? OK. Well, if we do have, I have uh, Wes, I think we have one more question up here. We've got since that one turned out to be quick. <laughs> uh, there was mentioned that, I'm oh, sorry, Bernard Lee, I'm a, stu a graduate student at Seton Hall. Um, uh, there was mentioned about this trade uh, treaty being more of a trade treaty. Um, and it's also quite some quite high standards compared to a number of other trade uh, trade agreements that the U.S. has been put into. Uh, we have an upcoming possibility of an EU-U.S. trade uh, free trade agreement, and then there's also the concern of having a high uh, maybe having a high standards agreement uh, for drug trafficking. Could, is the small this small uh, the arms treaty here a good? Does it set a good precedent for the U.S. to? Uh, get the ball rolling in other types of uh, high standards agreements with other countries and um, and improve the trade relations in in other areas of concern like drug trafficking or just a free trade agreement on both ends of the spectrum. Hmm. I'll give that to you again. Uh, I haven't thought about that question to be honest. Uh, the uh, look, I think whenever the United States shows both an appreciation, a willingness to listen to other countries' concerns on an issue, and also shows leadership in asserting U.S. national interests 
but bridging both our national interests and those of other states to reach an agreement that is embraced by all but three states in the world. I think it enhances United States prestige and it enhances the readiness of other states to negotiate with us seriously. So in that sense, I think this is a step forward. That's not what motivated us in this treaty. It's not what brought us to accept the final version, but it is an important benefit and it can carry over into other treaties. But in terms of the substance, is there something in this treaty that actually is of precedential value in the next trade treaty, whether it's a free trade agreement or something else? I haven't thought about that question and nothing leaps to mind as being immediately of value. That's an interesting question and we'll think. I think you can segregate these different treaties into boxes and then they really are not about the same type of thing. I think that you know, trade treaties are about liberalization of trade and removing barriers before trade. Export control treaties are about the opposite, increasing barriers. And governments segregate those two and say, okay, well, certain commodities need strong control. Certain commodities, let's liberalize them. Um, and I think that is sound policy. You have some strong, you know, strong control in some things and not in others. Um, Maybe just to say, I mean, just in general, it would be great if future treaties of any kind had such an important focus on these kind of humanitarian aspects. I think that was something the ATT did really well. I mean, I don't know on, on other trade treaties how applicable it would be, but um, I would think that would be a precedent, at least for certain kinds of treaties in, in the future, the way that some of these provisions were no negotiated to define war crimes and things like that. I think in that sense, it could be a precedent. We're at the end of our time. Please join me in thanking our panelists and the American Society for the